So without further ado, let me uh, present uh, Jennifer Granick. Um, those of you who know her understand how uh, well-versed and entertaining uh, she is as a speaker. Um, my brief introduction is going to be that she is currently the, I, I knew I would mess this up, Civil Liberties Director for EFF. And prior to uh, uh, taking this position, she was uh, a director of the Center for Internet uh, and Society at Stanford Law. That gives you a, a rough idea of what to expect from her. And we love her dearly. What can we say? Please welcome Jennifer. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for coming to our talk. Um, I know it is the end of the day, so we're going to try to make this interesting and fun. And uh, in order, oops, wrong one. Here's what I want. OK. And uh, in order to do that, what I decided to do today, you know, some of you may have heard me speak before, and I talk about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and these computer crime cases and, and what the statute says and all of this. And um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about two really fun cases that we did at the Electronic Frontier Foundation last year. And, um, and I'm going to tell the, these stories about what happened. And uh, hopefully through telling the stories about the fun stuff that happened, you'll learn something about the statute and learn something about what not to do yourselves. And I am going to be joined in this effort by my colleague, Kurt Opsahl, who's here at the table with me. He's a senior staff attorney at the EFF. And he is um, here to tell uh, some on-the-ground stories about our experience representing three MIT students who were sued by the Boston subway system right during DEF CON of last year. And uh, I had foolishly departed, but Kurt was still here um, on the ground trying to deal with this legal cataclysm that we had. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to talk about the law. I'm going to talk about the MIT case. And then I'm going to talk about a case that we did more recently representing a student from Boston College who was being investigated for sending a um, prank email to other students at his school. We get to do this work as part of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We also have a booth in the vendor area, so people who are interested more in the work that we do can stop by there um, and find out more. We're a membership-supported organization, and we do lots of work in this area representing computer security people and programmers and reverse engineers and hackers. We represent vitters and other people who mash up music and videos, and we fight for free speech online and for privacy and all of that sort of stuff. So if those are things that you care about and you want to know more or you want to become a member, you can go by our booth. Okay, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It is the federal statute that regulates computer crimes. There are also state statutes. Actually, in preparation for coming here to Nevada, I took a look at the Nevada computer crime statute. Um, I don't recommend it. It was sort of chilling, actually, what uh, the Nevada computer crime statute prohibits. It, it prohibits... Uh, tampering with documents outside of a computer system. So don't do anything to any documents that might be lying around on the desk near a computer system, or you might, at least in the confines of the state of Nevada. Um, it is made of several sections or subsections, which have various different relevant uh, parts to them. Um, and the uh, important part of it, though, is uh, what's an offense under it. And so there are a couple of things that are sort of particular or rarefied, like espionage or, um, you know, sort of the usual breaking into government systems. But there are two parts of the statute in particular that are commonly used um, by companies, usually, against computer security researchers or vulnerability reporters or, or those sorts. Of, um, or those sorts of activities, and I want to talk more specifically about those particular parts of the statute. Um, I'm just going to take a mention here as I'm at this slide about the issue of password trafficking. There are a couple of different federal statutes that deal with transmitting passwords or other kinds of access devices. There's another statute that deals particularly with access devices, and so you know those sorts of things are, are particularly um, are, are particularly regulated under the federal law. Federal law also regulates um, something called circumvention tools. So um, you'll see as we talk about these cases that the statute um, has kind of uh, a, a a prohibition against certain kinds of activities, which are considered offenses, and then the distribution of tools or 
uh, access codes or passwords subsequent to whatever might have happened is it can be another whole offense in and of itself. Okay, so Section 1030A2 um, is the probably the heart of Section 1030, and it prohibits you from accessing without authorization or exceeding authorized access to a computer and then obtaining any information. So um, what does this actually mean? We're going to talk about this. But the, but the hallmark, the key um, action that triggers the liability, that crosses you over from legal to illegal, is accessing without authorization or exceeding authorized, authorized access. Okay. And then there's another provision of the statute which I think was intended to get at sending malware or um, other kinds of viruses or, or that sort of stuff. And this provision deals with the transmission of um, harmful information. Whoever knowingly causes the transmission of a program information code or command and as a result of such conduct intentionally causes damage to the protected computer. So for this provision, A2, Question number one you have to be asking yourself is, what is access? And it turns out that access is everything, right? Anything you do to a computer, you know, in, in terms of like sending it a packet or logging in or like, going onto a web page or anything like that is access. Access isn't really a good delineator because uh, the case law all says, well, it's all access. So then you have to hope that the thing that distinguishes legal from illegal behavior is without authorization. Right, the question of when something's authorized and when it's not. And we're going to talk in this uh, later, later on about what authorization really means and how, how broad that is. So does authorization mean that you circumvented some kind of security measure and then you were without authorization? Does it mean that you, were, um, you, know, you need explicit written permission? We'll, we'll see. Okay. So the case that um, we were involved in following DEF CON of last year was MBTA versus Anderson. MBTA is the um, government agency that runs the Boston T subway system. Has anybody here ever ridden on that subway system? Okay. Did you guys ride for free? No, because you didn't get to go to this talk, probably, <laughs> that the students wanted to give last year. Um, so it's a nice subway system. I like it quite well. And uh, here's a nice picture of it. And uh, along with a little inset of one of the MIT students who had done the research to give this talk. So basically, these um, three guys who were undergraduates did some research for a class with Professor Ron Rivest. And their research was on two types of cards that you use, that are stored payment cards that you use to ride on the Boston subway system. There's a MagStripe card, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, and then a rather newer kind of card, which was um, RFID. And um, they basically, as part of their term paper for this class, reverse engineered the MagStripe card, which is called the Charlie Ticket. And you may, you may remember, for those of you maybe who are like my age or even a little bit older, the Charlie and the, you know, so, so anyway, it was called the Charlie ticket. And then they looked at and studied the RFID card, which was something new that the Boston subway system was about to deploy, and figured out based on the RFID protocol that it used some theoretical attacks you could use to, to undermine the card. And this was a talk that they were going to give at DEF CON. And they called the talk Anatomy of a Subway Hack. And in the abstract that they published for the talk up on the DEF CON website, they promised to teach people who attended the talk how to get free subway rides for life. Okay. So you can imagine that, you know, even though this was academic work that they did at MIT for a very well-known and well-respected professor, you can imagine that there might have been some consternation at the MBTA. And in order to deal with that issue, um, the students had a meeting with the MBTA before DEF CON. And they met with them, the, with the engineers and the, and the uh, tech guys from uh, MBTA before the Monday before the talk. Um, their professor came with them. And um, one of the concerns that MBTA had, one of their main concerns, was that the abstract on the website over-sensationalized the talk. It made it you know, too much. And they didn't like that it was so um, cavalier about free subway rides for life. So the students said, OK, no problem. We'll change the website. We'll make the talk less sensationalistic. And we'll kind of tone down some of the, you know, some of the rhetoric, which I think is one of the things that makes these, these talks fun, but, but can ruffle some feathers. Okay, so the students then 
fly to Las Vegas. They're here for uh, DEF CON, and it is the, I guess, the, the Friday before the talk. So now I'm going to, I was gone by this point in time because I was here for Black Hat last year, um, but luckily Kurt was here, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to him, and he's going to tell you a bit about what happened next. Well, so we, ha <clears throat> we had been at uh, both Black Hat and DEF CON uh, doing the EFF is in, uh, doing some consulting work for a variety of talks. Um, and, uh, you know, that was very interesting stuff, but at that point we pretty much thought for this particular talk that the issues had been uh, resolved with that August 4 meeting, um, and then uh, were caught a little bit uh, by surprise on, uh, on Friday when we heard that a lawsuit had been filed. And this, uh, this lawsuit um, was filed late on Friday afternoon in Boston, in the Boston Federal Court there, uh, due to the time difference, we heard about it a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Uh, we heard about it through uh, MIT because they, they did invite uh, MIT's attorneys to, uh, to attend, but uh, did not uh, give uh, any kind of realistic opportunity for the students to uh, get uh, attorneys there. In fact, uh, uh, it, it, I think they were surprised that the students uh, did have counsel. Um, and so when they showed up to file, they tried to get to see the judge immediately, absolutely. right? So it's usually when you file a lawsuit, you just dump your papers off at the courthouse and you go away. But they tried to get the uh, restraining order. They wanted to get order. a uh, temporary restraining order for a talk that was going to go on that Sunday. Uh, now, when you file a complaint, a TRO, or temporary restraining order, uh, four declarations, seven exhibits, it takes a while to put that together. Uh, it, it's not something that you decide to do in an afternoon and you just run out of time to tell anybody about it and get it to the courthouse. Uh, but, uh, but again, no, no advance notice and asking uh, for the duty judge uh, to deal with it because it came so late in the courthouse that the court was, was not open for regular business and one judge you know, gets the short stick and, and has to be the duty judge for the weekend. Uh, so it went onto that judge's desk uh, without uh, an opportunity for, for us to present any, any contrary views, uh, file any, any papers, or, or do anything. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the judge uh, uh, was unwilling to do the hearing right on the spot, um, and in fact scheduled it for the next morning uh, at 11 a.m. Uh, Boston time, which is 8 a.m. Uh, California or Nevada time. Uh, this was this was a bit of a challenge to put together a, uh, a cogent uh, response to this lawsuit uh, in uh, uh, well less than uh, 24 hours uh, with Jennifer on uh, on a plane uh, back to California. Uh, we would have to call in. Uh, this was a very very hectic time period and. Uh, pretty much required uh, uh, everyone on the EFF who was at the conference, plus uh, Jennifer back at the main office, to uh, uh, pull uh, an all-nighter and get together as much as we could in the time remaining. Yeah. So just a little bit about what the claims were in the case. Um, they claimed that there was a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that our, our clients, who were the students, had violated it, and that MIT had negligently supervised them by letting them do this research and, and purport to present it at the conference. And they uh, asked for uh, treble damages and attorney's fees, um, the main thing they wanted and the thing that the, restrain, the, the, the temporary restraining order they wanted, the gag order they were asking for that Friday afternoon would say, is that they didn't want the students to be able to say that the security had been compromised. Never mind anything about telling people what they'd done or how it was broken or how you could um, also compromise it. They just didn't want anybody to know that the security was compromised. Um, they didn't want the students to be able to say that MIT had approved of their research, even this was for a, a paper they got an A on for a class. They definitely didn't want them to say that you were getting free subway rides for life, and they wanted to force the students to take their research and provide it for free to the MBTA. The, one thing that was sort of particularly interesting about that was that they, you know, uh, the gag order, you can't say the security is, is compromised. Now, this is put into a public filing, um, so that, that the, the public filing explain what, what it is, what they were going to talk about, and how they had purported to compromise it. So, I mean, apparently they couldn't even, like, hand out a copy of the complaint to anybody because that might suggest that the security was, was compromised. Yeah, well, if you say, don't tell anybody the security is compromised, it makes you think, huh, <laughs> maybe it's compromised. <laughs> Otherwise, why are they asking for this gag order? 
um, this case is filled with those sorts of ironies. So, um, you know, it was, so Kurt talked about how t difficult it was and how we had to pull an all-nighter, but I mean, it was really, actually, even though it was, it was great that we were here in Las Vegas to do it. Uh, ab absolutely. One, one of the things that, that made this uh, uh, even remotely feasible uh, was uh, due to the support that uh, we got from DEF CON, uh, we were able to uh, uh, have access to a room which had a uh, probably one of the more secure connections that was available in the Riviera Hotel. Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, one thing that was very handy to us was to be able to get a, uh, an expert witness to put in a declaration to explain a little bit more about what was going on um, and not just have it rest upon the MBTAs. Now, ordinarily, it might be challenging to, you know, uh, uh, late night on a Friday, uh, find a computer security expert who could uh, fill out a declaration by 8 o'clock the next morning, but turns out that was not as much of a problem at DEF CON. <laughs> and uh, so we were able to get uh, Eric Johansson uh, to uh, uh, write a declaration, Robin Wagner, an attorney, uh, was able to help uh, uh, prepare that declaration and really uh, a big shout out to, to all the folks there that helped us out uh, in, in, uh, in our hour of need. Um, so the next morning, it was Saturday morning, I'd never done a court hearing on a Saturday before, and the hearing was 8 a.m. our time, and um, we all appeared by phone. So I was back at my house, or I guess I went into the office that morning, having just arrived from uh, Las Vegas the day before. Uh, and we were all in a, in a hotel room, uh, crowded around a mobile phone that had a speakerphone feature, uh, so that uh, the three defendants, and uh, uh, at that time we had three attorneys, who were uh, working on this, so the six of us crowded around a, uh, a little hotel uh, room table with a speakerphone. This is not, a, not an ideal um, forum in which to explain to the judge why it is that your uh, client's research is legitimate academic research that deserves to be reported in a um, setting where there's you know, peer review and sharing of information. Um, but we did, we did the best that we could. Um, and uh, the judge listened to what we had to say, and he was, you know, he was somewhat, uh, you know, mildly uh, interested in what we had to say, but he nevertheless issued the, a gag order. And I am, you know, basically saying, I'm the duty judge, it's the weekend, their talk's supposed to be tomorrow, I'm issuing the gag order, they can give their talk, um, but, I don't want them to help anybody else do anything illegal. So they can go ahead and give their talk. I'm not suppressing speech here or anything. Let them do what they're going to do. But they are enjoined from providing any program, code, information, or anything that would assist another person in any material way to circumvent the security on the, on the Boston subway system. And so then this is going to be the presentation, and it, or the, this is going to be my order. And if you don't like it, you can take it up with the regular judge when he comes back on Monday or Tuesday or whenever his calendar will allow it. So you can take a look at this and think about, now try to put yourself in our shoes, right? We're the lawyers. We need to advise these kids. One thing you definitely don't want to do is um, disobey a direct court order and get held in contempt. And so here we are looking at their presentation and having to decide what would assist another person in a material way, whatever that means, to circumvent or attack the security of the Boston Tea. And we and, have no idea. I mean, read, read broadly, if, if they handed somebody a copy of uh, applied cryptography, you know, this would violate the, the order because that would help someone attack yeah. uh, I mean, a saying like you saying I did it may invite somebody to try, where maybe otherwise they would be trying to hack the, the San Francisco, um, you know, with the BART or something like that. So we really couldn't meaningfully in any way advise our clients about how to walk this line. And in that, you know, in, the, in that uh, situation, we had to cancel the presentation. Uh, but we were able to give a press conference about the court lawsuit. Um, so uh, instead of our, uh, our usual uh, Ask EFF panel uh, at DEF CON, we held a, a press conference and dis discussed w what had occurred over the, over the past hours, what happened at the hearing, the TRO, and the circumstances of the case, and saying as much as we, we, we felt uh, uh, comfortable saying, um, which had sort of the odd effect of actually drawing a lot of attention to the situation um, that uh, uh, perhaps was 
not the best way to not draw attention to your security um, <laughs> circumstances. Indeed, if you didn't want anyone to know the security was compromised, this was probably the wrong way of going about it. Um, but, but from our standpoint, and I think from the standpoint of the students, and I think from the standpoint of any researcher who speaks at a conference, we were worried, um, obviously, because this was a ruling that said that giving out information at a conference can violate the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act if it could materially help another person in compromising the security of a system. And so we were you know, extremely concerned about this, and why is it that the judge didn't get it? I mean, why didn't the judge get it? Well, I think there was a couple of things other than, um, you know, the, I, I mean, I think the obvious thing was that the judge doesn't know, and the judges are, you know, afraid, and they need to, um, they feel like, well, we need to make sure nothing bad happens, and I'm going to take the word of the subway assistant on this as opposed to these three kids who are at their hacker conference and want to have fun in Vegas. Um, and so there was a lot of atmospherics that went into that that I think caused the, the judge to have some reservations. And for the judge, the idea like, you know, they're not going to get to give their talk on Sunday doesn't really kind of make him all that worried versus somebody will hack the system and steal millions of dollars from the Boston, uh, you know, from the Boston Transit Authority, which is already probably almost bankrupt and we can't have that happening. So they don't, you know, I think there is even among, you know, people who have gone to law school, sometimes a feeling like they don't really understand the importance of the First Amendment value of free speech and the free exchange of ideas, and that time does matter. Time is of the essence in these things. Um, and, and so the judge was just like, look, we're, I'm going to punt, and we'll be able to consider this more judiciously in the light of next week. But of course, by then it was too late. Too late for DEF CON. So we had to mount our defense in light of these problems that we had. Um, we made a motion for reconsideration before the real judge, and we got a letter from a bunch of renowned computer scientists saying, look, judge, you know, we understand what the MBTA is telling you, but this is the way that things are done. This is what we do. We do our research and we report it at conferences. And that is part of the free exchange of ideas and part of our, part of our scholarly work. And this is also a, a very nice thing, both for, for being at a, a computer security conference uh, and, and having the connections that we do uh, with the computer security world at, uh, at EFF uh, is to be able to get in touch with uh, leading computer scientists uh, and have them understand these issues and prepare a, a letter on the subject uh, within, within days. Yeah, which was great because we needed it in days because our next hearing was set for the Tuesday. And we filed this brief saying that the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act doesn't apply. So we had the legal stuff, but we understood that there was atmospherics involved here and that we needed to help explain to the judge why it was that this wasn't just about a couple of kids in Vegas. This was something that was really important. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the legal part. So here's what the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act section that our, uh, our clients were sued under says. And I'm just going to point out, causes the transmission, this is what they said, they were causing the transmission of information that would cause damage without authorization to the computer. And what they were arguing was that when they said transmission, transmission includes a verbal communication, and it's a verbal communication that can cause damage to a computer because somebody else can take that information and use it to exploit the system. Okay, so we were, and, and then they said, look, there's nothing, this isn't a free speech issue, judge, this is something that, that computer scientists agree with, and that's why they have this idea of responsible disclosure. And they had these quotes from, you know, from Microsoft and from Google, and they're saying, like, here, responsible disclosure is the industry standard in computer security, and responsible disclosure means you don't tell anybody anything until we have a chance to fix it because otherwise it might be compromised. And they had all these quotes about it, and they're like, okay, so that's what, we, that's what we're asking you to do. It's nothing out of the ordinary. There's no reason to, to be afraid here. And here I just took a little clip from the brief so that you can see how they, how they described it. Okay. Um, so, you know, it, 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 going back kind of to the, just to briefly to the issue that Kurt raised before about, um, you know, putting all this information and all these, um, 
all these exhibits into the record and all this stuff like saying we don't want them to say that the security's been compromised, pointing out that the security's been compromised, is really this very lopsided kind of thing where they can put whatever they want in the public eye and on the public record, but if we do it, then it violates responsible disclosure and there's a chance that you're breaking the CFAA or you're breaking the judge's, uh, the judge's order or something like that. And they, they were not shy about putting things in the record. There, there were like uh, something in the order of 60 uh, different things filed over the course of, of the lawsuit, which is like that's averaging six a day. This is this is more than you would see filed in a typical lawsuit for like months. Yeah. Uh, and it, we it were was, here. I mean, most of our people were here. Fast and furious uh, filings. Um, and then the other thing I would say about that is even though there were all of these declarations and all of these exhibits and that they managed to file, for some reason they neglected to say that our students had met with them prior to DEF CON to tell them about the problem on that Monday. That wasn't something that they admitted was true until after we had our students put a declaration in saying that they had done it and then they put a declaration in from their experts saying yes indeed it had happened. But they basically didn't even you know, admit that during the first well, and round I, of briefing. And I think that the, over the course of it the, the story uh, became a little bit clearer uh, and that uh, even it seemed at least one declarant that they, they filed uh, what uh, six or seven days in um, was describing that meeting and actually seemed to agree with the students side of the story um, and that, uh, that the meeting you know, hadn't gone particularly badly and that uh, it hadn't been uh, that, you know, someone might have left that meeting uh, with the impression that, that things were okay. And that it was perfectly fine to go ahead and give the talk and with MBTA's blessing. So, you know, usually I tell my clients, you know, when, I, when, when we work through some of these issues, I usually tell my clients that I think it's a lot better to talk to the engineers first than it is to talk to the policy people or the PR people or the higher ups, because the engineers understand, you know, they're the ones who are like charged with dealing with the security and it's not going to totally freak them out and they're not going to be thinking about the bad press or that sort of thing. But I think one thing I learned from this case is, yeah, you go and you talk to the engineers first, but after you talk to the engineers, you've got to get the buy-in from the higher, higher ups, because we had, my, the students had the stamp of approval, but it wasn't stamped by the right person. Okay. Well, and this gets a little bit back to the, the culture clash issue as well uh, that you had mentioned earlier, that uh, you know, the MBTA is not a type of institution that has a lot of experience dealing with security vulnerability disclosures. So that a you know a software company or a computer company uh, deals with them a lot, has, has a certain understanding of it. Their policy people are familiar with it, uh, but uh, if you are a transit agency, you don't have that same kind of experience, and that adds a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt. Uh, we were talking about in the context of the judge, but also in the policymakers of the institution if they're not familiar with this world. Yeah, I mean, what we've seen, I think, is it turns out nowadays software companies are actually much better at dealing with this thing than they used to be, and it's the kind of first contact people like a subway system that has the biggest, has bigger problems. So this is the First Amendment, um, which protects free speech, and we raised that issue as well. And we had a hearing before the judge, the real judge, on the on the Thursday of that week, and we argued our, uh, you know, we argued our, our, our case, and it was one of these things where, as Kurt said, you know, we had so many filings in this case, and what would happen is, you know, they would be calling us and talking to us and saying, like, listen, I'm sure we can settle this whole thing, it's no big, you know, we, why don't your students just promise to do this or promise to do that, and then we'd hang up the phone and 30 seconds later, like six new filings would come through the court ECF. The court has an electronic filing system, so six new filings would come through the court uh, system, you know, and, and there would be like a new motion from them with like different declarations and stuff. So, you know, they had this big law firm that was basically like just spitting out paper while they were like chitter chattering with us on the phone. Right? They filed a motion while, for, for, the, for the final hearing in this case, they filed motions while our lawyers who were going to argue the, the final hearing were in flight. Yeah, I mean, it, it happened, yeah, that, that morning, you, no chance for, uh, for, uh, uh, to, any, to respond to it in any meaningful way before the hearing, um, just, just getting it on file and actually uh, you, you, had to, you had to find out about the, the motion while at the hearing and, and receive a copy for the first time and then be expected to, to respond yeah. to it. And when I, when, when I went to this hearing on Thursday, this Thursday, August 14th hearing, and they handed me a bunch of papers and I'm like, 
flipping through, you know, and the judge is like, Miss Granick, do you have anything to say? And I was like, not right now, but I will in, you know, in a minute. Just, I have to even just it's, read it. It, it. It's a technique that sometimes occurs in, in the world of litigation is trying to bury uh, the other side in, in paper. Uh, and I think this, this may have uh, uh, been a, an effective uh, uh, strategy if you're up against people who have to pay for their, their counsel and thus have uh, uh, hard limits in how much work they can do in responding to it. Uh, but uh, we actually kind of enjoy this thing and, and though it was a lot of uh, work, uh, you know, we're, we're happy to keep on, uh, keep on fighting despite how much paper is raining in. Yeah, we can pull all-nighters all week long if that's what it takes. So, um, so basically at this point the judge said, I think that I'm going to allow there to be more discovery in this case and I'm going to set it for next week. So he punted and again, just you can see this like, let's just be slow and measured about this and kind of, you know, get some more information and see what's going to happen. Um, so that was the hearing on Thursday and he set it over for the Tuesday following. And at the Tuesday following, um, our colleagues, uh, Cindy Cohen and Marsha Hoffman went to court that day. I was um, away by then. And we all otherwise sort of dialed in by phone. And there was a hearing before the judge. And um, the court considered our papers. And the most important thing that happened during that hearing was the comma. So going back to the CFAA, I wonder if you guys noticed this, because I know you all read code all the time and stuff, and so here's a little lesson in reading legal code. The CFAA has a little comma between the word authorization and the words to a protected computer. So what we had argued in our paper was that this means that you can't transmit information one place and have it cause damage to another place, to, a, to another computer under the CFAA, because then there wouldn't be a comma there. What the statute says is you transmit the information to the protected computer and it causes damage to a protected computer. So if you don't have both the transmission and the damage being caused to a protected computer, you don't have a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act claim. That's why Congress put that comma in there. Now, don't ask me whether you have to have the same protected computer if I can transmit information to one protected computer and have it cause damage on another protected computer. But we said either way, conference is not a computer. And co Congress means what Congress says, and Congress put a comma there. And <laughs> I know. We had this. <laughs> yeah. So we have, you know, so much for the First Amendment, right? You know, we're like, this is a free speech case. And the judge is like, I find that that comma is relevant. So as a result, there was no federal claim, because the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act statute was gone. So there's, that was their only federal claim. So it defeats federal court jurisdiction. And he said, OK, well, I no longer have jurisdiction. It's not a federal case. There's no federal claim. So you can't get a preliminary injunction. And I don't have any jurisdiction to keep the gag order going anymore. So the gag order is lifted. So that's it. You're done. So we were totally psyched. And um, you know, this is, for us, like, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's not, like I said, it's not like, I you know, the First Amendment governs here, but this is like a total win for us. So we were really, really happy. Absolutely. And I, I mean, it, it answered an important question. No one had previously thought that transmission of information meant speaking to an audience. But until a court actually looks at the language and rules that way, it creates this uncertainty and, and doubt. And if that was true, if, if the MBTA's position was right, uh, it would affect far more than just the, uh, the students at issue here or one particular uh, talk, but that everybody who would give a talk about computer security would potentially be violating uh, federal criminal laws uh, by transmitting information that could assist somebody in attacking a computer system. It would, it would sort of tear the heart out of uh, the notion of talking openly about uh, computer security. And we were sure that that was the wrong interpretation, uh, but uh, uh, you know, in order to uh, solidify that, it is critical to have a, a judge look at it and agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so then, um, after all that, we, uh, you know, we basically were real, we were all really happy, and we were able to very amicably resolve the case with the students basically going to the MBTA and telling them what their research was and everything they found, and um, MBTA promising that maybe they would fix everything, which was all the students really wanted, other than giving their talk in the first place. And the current status of the case is that it's over and everything's done and it's dismissed and closed and it is um, behind us. 
So uh, very um, positive and happy ending, but for a while a very scary thing with the Boston subway system trying to enforce its definition of responsible disclosure on everybody who gives talks about computer security at conferences. Okay, I'm going to take questions just briefly if anybody has any questions about this before I move to the next case. Yeah. So what, what did it cost them to do this lawsuit, or what would it have? Well, we're free. Oh, yeah, we're, we're free. I can't even imagine how much this must have cost them. Uh, it, Between their in-house lawyer and the firm, the, the, out, uh, the, the outside firm, what do you, what do you think? I mean, I, you know, I, I used to work at a, uh, a law firm before I came to EFF, and so I have some sense of, of how much uh, litigation would, would cost. Um, and we would often estimate, you know, between twenty and forty thousand dollars for for filing a motion, uh, and there were many motions filed. Uh, you know, I don't know if MBTA gets a break on the price, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it probably cost them a lot. It cost a lot of money. Yes, you, you yes. Okay, so his question was, responsible disclosure, did MBTA have time to fix it, and was it responsible to save free subway rides for life? Um, I don't know whether MBTA had time to fix it. They didn't ask for additional time. I suspect that the problems, the theoretical problems found in the MyFair RFID card were not fixable. I think they were protocol problems, so I think they would have had to implement it totally differently from how they were planning on implementing it. Um, but there were some things that they could have done to, for the magstripe, do you remember? Well, and, and, I mean, I think uh, uh, coming up on a, on a, uh, shortly in our slides is, is the students then uh, uh, subsequently worked with the MBTA to, to help them resolve their uh, security uh, uh, issues. Um, and so in that, in that sense, you know, that's what they were trying to do. And I think, you know, with the, with the free subway rides for life, I mean, that, uh, that obviously caused a lot of um, heartburn over at the MBTA, and that's part of the cultural class. What they meant by that is sort of like, look at these sort of bad securities, contemptible fools. They are, uh, their security is so bad that one could have free subway rides for life. They didn't mean it in the sense of, come on down and we'll tell you how to do it. In fact, they were, they were planning uh, on uh, not disclosing some key bits of, of information uh, such that anyone who attended the talk would, would uh, be able to see that it, it could be done but wouldn't have the requisite information to do it themselves uh, uh, immediately uh, thereafter. Um, so, you know, perhaps uh, free subway rides for life, you know, if it wasn't there, could have made it less of a panicky thing for the MBTA. Uh, but I think part of it is also that the MBTA didn't really understand how the hacker culture, in a sense, is, is trying to show uh, and criticize uh, security systems by pointing out that they can be broken and that somebody could abuse them uh, without necessarily meaning that everyone should go out and immediately take advantage of all these flaws. I personally tend to be a little bit more, you know, kind of towards the towards the extreme side on this sort of rhetoric. I mean, I think of a, that free sub subway rides for life as marketing. I think of that as something that makes the talk sound fun and interesting and brings people in the door. And in, to me, I put it in the same category as saying, fuck the draft, instead of saying, like, resist the draft. Cohen versus California, free speech case there. And to me, I think you, I think that, you know, you, sometimes you need hyperbole to get your point across and to get people to pay attention and be interested. So that's how I feel. Um, I think that, you know, obviously, what Kurt said is absolutely true. They felt differently, but that, that's my feeling. So I'm going to take two more and then move on. So yes, sir. What is a protected computer under the CFAA? A protected computer basically means a computer that's used in interstate commerce. It is the um, trigger for federal jurisdiction since federal courts have limited jurisdiction. And, and basically, it, if it's connected to the internet, um, if the parts were transmitted, arguably, in interstate commerce. So protected computer is not really a, a delimiter in any way. There was an interesting question actually associated with what a protected computer was in the case. Not, not whether it was in the category of that's protected, but whether it was a computer, whether the MyFair-based uh, uh, RFID card uh, was a computer. Um, and the, the definition requires it to be a high-speed data processing uh, device. And so there, there, there is a, a question as to you know, what constitutes a computer when you're talking about 
uh, an RFID card or, or some other sort of non-traditional uh, computer. Uh, that, that ended up not being a critical issue uh, because of the magic comp. Yeah, but it, it, one of the reasons it wasn't a critical issue was because um, those of you who don't live in Boston may not know this, but apparently the T has a, a stop in Rhode Island. So they were like, hey, we got a stop in Rhode Island. There's your interstate commerce. Forget about it. That's right. <laughs> Remember that? That's right. <laughs> yeah, Andrew. Yeah. Did the MBTA actually learn anything here? Would they, would they act differently next time? And is, is there any way that we avoid having this be one off the next time it's in San Francisco or London? Right. And so, so, so are there lessons learned beyond our having this nice court ruling? And did the MBTA learn anything? I think they did. I think as the case sort of went on, we um, got to, they took a, a, a lighter hand with us and had us deal with the different attorneys who were internal, who I think handled things differently, and, and I think expressed some sorrow that things had gotten so out of hand and expensive, <laughs> you know, as they did. And, and I do think that this is one of the reasons why we try to publicize what happened in these cases more widely is because we do want, you know, San Francisco or New York or Atlanta or, you know, all the other um, subway and transit systems that are susceptible to this same RFID card problem to think before they take this strategy um, as opposed to, you know, fi fixing their thing. So I think to some extent the publicity about it definitely helps um, kind of be, people be more measured. I mean, look at how the software industry has dealt with disclosure that, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it's not perfect, but it's certainly not what it was 10 years ago. I think lessons are definitely learned. Okay, so moving along uh, to our other case. This is our, the, the Boston College case, but in order to understand this case, I have to tell you a little bit about the United States versus Laurie Drew case. And this was a lawsuit brought in, uh, or a criminal uh, case brought in Los Angeles against a woman from Missouri who had a fake MySpace profile, and through the fake MySpace profile um, had communications with a teenage girl, and uh, the profile was falsely in the name or identity of a teenage boy. The, um, profile was used to say mean things to this girl, and the girl committed suicide. So people may know this is the Megan Meyer case, um, but the, but the, the uh, Missouri housewife who is involved in setting up the MySpace pro profile was Lori Drew, and there was no Missouri law that really reached her conduct. I don't want to get too much into, into what the facts of the case were, because it's not important for, for this discussion, but there were some sort of factual disputes about who did what, the upshot of it being that Missouri decided they couldn't prosecute her, and so a United States attorney in in Los Angeles decided that they would prosecute her under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And so they charged her in LA, which is where MySpace servers are located, and they said, okay, well, MySpace's terms of service say that you shall not provide false information. And when you provided false information and pretended that you were this um, teenage boy instead of you, Lori Drew, you violated that terms of service. And that means that you were having unauthorized access to MySpace's servers. And that unauthorized access is prohibited by the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Okay, so another, so basically what this would do is this turns any kind of terms of service violation into a federal crime. So, you know, what we did when we, we, we filed an amicus brief in this case, and we looked at some of the other terms of service that are out there for services that people use really regularly. For example, Google says you won't use the Google service unless you're of the legal age of consent, like the age where you can contract. So for all the people out there who are under the age of 18 who are using Google, you're violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act under this theory that the United States Attorney put out. Um, you know, we looked at Match.com. I didn't look at Match.com. I'm not allowed on Match.com because Match.com says you will not use our service um, or access any of our services unless you are um, single or separated. And I'm married, so I had somebody else who was single or separated look up the terms of service because I was afraid. So for all those adulterers out there who are using Match, you know, or who are thinking, I wonder who's out there, you know, um, you're violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So we filed a brief in this case, and the, tri the woman was brought to trial. She was convicted of a misdemeanor, and just like a couple of weeks ago, the judge overturned the conviction and said, if we interpret the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act so broadly that any kind of terms of service violation is a unauthorized access, then the statute is just too vague. People don't know what is prohibited and what's not prohibited, and it's just too much. And you're really delegating to private parties the ability to decide what's a crime and what's not a crime, and there's not even necessarily some requirement there that people have read the terms of service, who even knows. 
So how did we get there? Well, there were a couple of really bad cases dealing with this concept of, un, of lack of authorization and, and what it means. Oh, here, I gave you the, I, I put these in here, I didn't realize. So there, there are a couple of cases dealing with what's lack of authorization and what it means. And, you know, so unfortunately, a lot of the cases kind of have a, you know it when you see it. You know you weren't supposed to do that kind of thing in it. And this was one of those types of cases where it's like, you know you weren't supposed to do it because it was in the terms of service. And, you know, what we ask for, what I ask for when I have a federal crime is that it be something that meaningfully delineate between harmful um, behavior that people take with a kind of, um, you know, that's the type of thing that ought to be criminally punished for which you should go to prison and stuff that's like kind of a more um, pedestrian type of tran transgression along the lines of what I think happened in our Boston College case. So what happened here is we had a student and he was accused of sending an email to the Boston College community um, and the email came from this bcglbtq at yahoo.com as opposed to at um, bostoncollege.edu and it purported to be this message from their um, gay lesbian association welcoming this particular, our, our, my client's former roommate into the, um, into the community. And the former roommate um, denied that he was gay and that this had anything to do with him. And basically, they uh, tried to trace the email to who might have sent it, because the roommate was uh, dis discomfited by it. And they believed that they had traced it to our client, who had, who had been roommates with this guy in the past, and they had, some, they had a falling out. So um, they then decided that this arguably violated the Massachusetts computer crime law, and they went to the judge to get a search warrant. And the search warrant was just awesome in terms of the stuff that they used to kind of build up their case. Now, search warrant, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, is an authorization that police or law enforcement need to invade your expectation of privacy, like go into your dorm room or your house or something like that. And they have to show to a judge that they have probable cause to believe that they're going to find evidence of a crime. So they have to have an affidavit that the court, that the, that the uh, officer swears to that tells the story about why they think there's a crime, and the judge has to read it and sign off on it. So there were a couple of really juicy little points that they used to show why it was that they thought that, you know, my guy definitely did it. And it was because he was a computer science major considered a master of the trade among his peers. So. He must have sent this email from Yahoo. And then they said, well, you know, it's not uncommon for him to appear with unknown laptop computers, which he says are given to him by Boston College for field testing or that he's fixing for other students. He did work in the IT department. <laughs> and then this one was our favorite. You know, the, the, we've, we've, we blacked out the roommate's name, but you can see they reported he uses two different operating systems to hide his illegal activities. <laughs> One is the regular BC operating system, and the other is a black screen with white font, which he uses prompt commands on. Yeah. So, use Linux, get searched. Okay. So, um, you know, there was some, just for those of you who, fo who followed this case, there was some, like, debate later on on... Uh, on Slashdot and some of the other uh, some of the other websites about whether we were kind of overplaying how ridiculous this was and whether this wasn't just something to show that you know the roommate was familiar with our client's computer. It's like of course he was familiar with our client's computer. They were roommates for you know a year or whatever. No, they were really tying in the search warrant affidavit, as you can see from this quote, they were really tying the use of a an orthodox operating system to uh, hiding illegal activities. We were pretty, we laughed and then we cried. Okay, so, so Massachusetts computer crime statute had two relevant sections. Um, one prohibits obtaining computer services by fraud or misrepresentation. Um, and we're like, huh, how does that apply really? How could that be it? It's like, there's no computer services that are obtained by fraud. I, I mean, I guess maybe theoretically Yahoo, but Yahoo doesn't care if you give the right name or if it's your right email address or anything like that. And then um, the unauthorized access to computer system, and this is, the, uh, this is the statute. And you'll see how different, really, in a way, and how much more enlightened, um, I think the Massachusetts citizens will be happy to know, that this statute is compared to the federal statute or to certainly to Nevada's statute, um, because they're talking about, you know, in sort of thinking about what is authorized, what 
what type of thing is, is authorized, um, they have this statement at the end that the requirement of a password or other authentication to gain access shall constitute notice that access is limited to authorized users. So this idea, it's not saying, you know, but this idea that, look, you know, we're not talking about, you know, terms of service or you know you shouldn't have done that or it wasn't nice when you, um, we're talking about circumventing some kind of security measure, something where, you know, we tried to keep people out and we, and you came in anyway. So those were the crimes they said sending this email violated, uh, or the statutes they said sending the email violated, and the police seized all this stuff. Cell phone, iPod, digital camera, and the incriminating Ubuntu Linux CD, <laughs> proving that he did, in fact, use a black screen with, uh, with fonts. So what the, what the, <laughs> with a white, prompt commands on it. So what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts argued, um, and here I have a little clip of the thing that we can see right here, is they said, look, you know, um, you, you know, you basically we said, look, there's no, there's no unauthorized access here. He just sent emails to the listserv at the school. It's no, this isn't, this isn't, you know, maybe it wasn't nice. Well, first of all, we doubt, we deny it. We're like, you don't, we didn't, okay, so, so <laughs> let me go back. So if he did it, all he did was send emails, because this was in a, in a very early stage. This wasn't where he was charged yet. It was still in an investigation. And we felt confident, and I feel even more confident now, that as the course of the investigation goes on, they will find that our guy was not the perpetrator of this particular email hoax. But for the purposes that we were involved in the, in the context of our litigation, we were making a motion for return of his property, because it was the end of the term, and he was a graduating student, and he needed to finish up his work and graduate and get out of there. So we were like, he needs his computer, he doesn't have anything to work on, and he's a computer science major, master of his trade. And you know, what about his what about his camera and stuff? So we had made a motion for return of this property, and all of our arguments were in, made in the context of you know, assuming you were right that you needed you know that this investigation was pointing at him. You know, this is still improper. So that's the that's the context of this. So we said, look, no matter what, sending these emails is not a violation of the computer crime law. And they said, look, you know, one can infer that sending emails from another individual to the Boston College system is violates their policy about how students should treat each other and therefore constitutes the crime of unauthorized use of computer. So you see here their argument is very much, very much the idea, you know you shouldn't have done that, that wasn't nice. And therefore, it's a crime. Okay. And we were vigorous about this. We had the Lori Drew case had not yet been decided. It was sort of hanging over our heads. We had all those other bad cases talking about um, wayward employees who took information before they went to competitors and stuff. And so we had to argue this. And um, it has, Massachusetts has a very interesting, weird um, procedure. But basically, we got very quickly before a judge from the um, highest court in the state. Um, they have this because of their interesting process. And the judge said, um, sending emails from public email services does not seem to constitute the crimes of obtaining computer services by fraud or misrepresentation or unauthorized access. The Commonwealth's claim that such an email might be unlawful because it violates a hypothetical internet use policy maintained by BC goes well beyond the reasonable inferences that may be drawn from the affidavit for the search warrant and would dramatically expand the appropriate scope of the Massachusetts computer crime law. So this was, our, this was our, our victory here. They had other arguments because they had filled up the search warrant affidavit with so many other disparaging comments, like he was fixing computers and he was, um, um, I think one of the allegations was the student said he had seen him hack grades or something like that, and we're like, there's no reason to believe that any of that is true. So the judge agreed with us, quashed the search warrant, and ordered that all of our students' stuff get returned, which it did, and he's going to graduate, and everything now is, is fine, though it was sort of scary. So what is the scary lesson to be learned from all of this? Lesson number one, the CFAA is dangerous. Um, like many computer crime statutes, but particularly the CFAA, this concept of unauthorized access does not meaningfully delineate between criminal and non-criminal behavior. It puts an immense amount of power in the hands of the um, plaintiff, 
And because of the way that the statute is phrased and everything, it's subject to misinterpretation and misuse, like MBTA did by ignoring that all important comma and saying it's the transmission of information that's a problem. I think we really need to go back and look through all our statutes and rethink any ones that prohibit anything having to do with the transmission of information um, and, and maybe get rid of that, except under very narrow or very specifically defined circumstances. Um, okay. Instructional speech is less likely to be protected by courts. So, you know, the courts maybe understand academic kind of talking about stuff, but what courts do not like is teaching somebody how to get free subway rides for life, right? Courts, even though the court cases say that code is speech, courts are nervous about code because code does stuff. So anything that's like illustrative or teaching or instructional or, you know, stuff like that, makes courts nervous because they think somebody else is going to misuse it, even though you know, it may be very important in getting the message across. The first contact situations are the hardest, definitely, as we, mm -hmm. as we discussed. Um, and here's our other lessons. Atmospherics matter a lot. You know, having, who knows whether we ended up with the result we ended up in in the MIT case because, um, you know, sort of time and cooler heads prevailed, or whether the court maybe was influenced by the idea that so many computer science um, academics and professionals would sign a letter against what the MBTA was setting and say, like, look, okay, this isn't something where, you know, it's just some kids against the MBTA. This is actually something, you know, where reasonable professionals have a difference of opinion. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, when people come to us before they give talks at DEF CON or Black Hat and they talk to us, we talk with them about atmospherics and about doing some risk management between making the talk sound really fun and exciting and bringing people in the door and, um, and, and you know, how much feathers that's going to ruffle, um, even though it actually has absolutely nothing to do with what you're allowed to do or what the statute prohibits or anything like that. Um, another lesson, I think, is that litigation can be grueling, right? It can be very, very grueling. But, and I think the, the corresponding lesson of that is don't mess with us because we're free. So, you know, it cost the MIT, uh, some subway system, a lot of money to deal with this. And, you know, we caught up on our sleep just, you know, a couple of weeks later. So we were okay. <laughs> but, but think about it, you know, think about it before, you know, companies, I think, should think about it before they get into it. But I think also for people who give presentations, and I've seen this a number of times with a number of my clients, you know, um, you can get worn down. It becomes really hard to be under this kind of um, attack and this kind of scrutiny all the time, especially once discovery comes and you've got to file declarations. I mean, in a sense, litigation is, is something that can be sort of mutually assured destruction, that, that both parties are, are ending up losing because of the transaction costs of going through the, uh, through the uh, process. And that's especially true if it's uh, uh, commercial litigation where uh, you know, each side are paying for it. I mean, the lawyers are, are winning in, in terms of getting a lot of fees, but it's, it's very uh, damaging to the, uh, to the participants involved. Uh, but uh, uh, nevertheless, it, it happens. It happens quite frequently that there is, there is litigation. Um, the only people who benefit are us, the yeah, lawyers. Yeah, the, lawyers <laughs> the lawyers get a lot out of it. Um, and so it, it's, it's, that is a nice disincentive for someone to go ahead and, and sue. Uh, but that disincentive is, is often not powerful enough, uh, especially if they think that they can strike hard and, and uh, provide a lot of um, effort uh, in the beginning to sort of overwhelm the other side. Um, and also when, when feathers are ruffled sufficiently that, uh, that large institutions that do have that kind of money uh, are willing to, to put that, uh, that level of effort and, and cash into trying to uh, stop a, a security violation. Now, the, the lesson that I would hope that at least uh, comes out of this a little bit is that this is not actually necessarily a effective tactic, um, and that you know working with uh, the security community uh, is, is better than fighting against it. Um, you know, uh, one one of the effects of the MBTA case was that this this news story. Uh, was on the front page of the Boston Globe and the, you know, the editorial boards and the TV stations all, all throughout Boston. Actually, newspapers across the country were, were covering this. It became a, a, a major uh, issue. Um, and I think that, that probably was not something in, in the MBTA's original uh, strategic goals. Um, and it is sort of far better for all, all involved to try and work something out 
um, and uh, not have it to come to massive litigation. But we're there in case it does. Yeah. Um, and, and then I think finally is this idea that, you know, this ta what responsible disclosure is as sort of like a norm or as like a personal ethic or as like kind of a guiding idea that researchers might use to kind of decide when the company's waited for too long or what details to release or that sort of thing is one thing. But making it a legal rule is another thing entirely. I mean, and, and not only making it a legal rule, but tying that up into a criminal code as, as well is, is uh, you know, you can have people weighing in what they think responsible disclosure may be, and those are very important conversations, and I think that uh, a lot of professionals have uh, views on what, what that might be. Um, but to turn what are best practices within an industry and subject to uh, debate uh, within the community into something that is being enforced by federal criminal laws uh, really changes the character of that debate uh, su substantially. Um, and it's also sort of not, not clear that the best source of what responsible disclosures rules uh, should be is the outcome of a court case um, and you know, should, between should, a subway system and three MIT kids, right? Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. Know, in, part in particular, uh, ruled on by some judge ruled that we got pulled out of the who hamper. Made, who, who, yeah, who got pulled out of the, the you know randomly selected for the case uh, between uh, uh, students in a transit system, uh, and really that's something that that is is uh, pro more appropriately subject of debate within the community, and with and and should any norm uh, emerge from that should have the support of a wide consensus. Yeah, absolutely. So what can you do? Um, and here I am almost right on, on time. What can you do? Okay, terms of service are a problem. Be very careful about agreeing to them. Um, if you really want to be super careful, you can always get permission for the testing that you are going to do. You can perform testing only on your own systems, because if you damage your own system, you're perfectly fine, while if you cause some damage or get some unauthorized access to somebody else's system, then you may get into trouble. Um, you can seriously consider the atmospherics, which is what I was saying before. And I, as I, you know, as I think you know, you know from my answer to this gentleman over here, I think atmospherics is valuable, and I think it's important, but you have to do some risk management when you're going to uh, present, and, and you may need to tone things down a little bit in order to, uh, to attract less unsavory attention. Um, Work with and educate the vendors, both about your work, perhaps, and maybe also about what, what it is that um, researchers do in terms of reporting and peer review at conferences. Another thing you can do is to be prepared for litigation. If you think that, you know, if you're giving a talk and you think your talk is one that might be kind of controversial, you can get yourself ready, both psychologically in terms of stealing yourself for that grueling ordeal, and then also in terms of uh, talking to an attorney. And, um, you know, you can co always come and call us. We talk to people all the time. If your case isn't right for us, we can help you find somebody who is right for you and refer you out. Um, and I think that, that that's sometimes uh, useful and comforting. And um, then uh, write to Congress. You know, we have these statutes on the books, and the way that they're being interpreted is really of concern. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was most recently amended in September of 2008. They amend it all the time to make it broader and more pernicious. So, you know, keep track and pay attention to what's happening with these laws and write to your congressman and say, you know what, I think that this has gone far enough. This is actually getting to a point where it's being used to hurt computer security researchers. Okay, so let us take questions either about the cases or this aspect of the law or anything like that. And I think um, we were going to do the microphone for question and answer part. Yes. So if you have a question, uh, Ray will bring you the, the microphone so that I don't have to report it. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the eating and drinking. Andrew has another question. Ray, Andrew has another question. Actually, uh, it's not so much a question as a comment. Uh, your point about atmospherics and educate the vendor, uh, I would suggest that oftentimes uh, there are other people that could be brought into that conversation. Uh, I, uh, I think that I was uh, helpful earlier this year in uh, educating a vendor uh, and in also uh, de-escalating some of those atmospherics. So, Think about what other third parties uh, you might know who can help in that regard. <laughs>
Andrew's absolutely right. He helped, he, and I can't, I can't give you details, but he helped me immensely in a situation we had earlier in the year where um, we had a potential conflict between a vendor and a researcher. And the conflict affected other parties, like Andrew's company. And so he said, you know, can you help us here and help explain to them what the situation is and kind of, you know, diffuse things a little bit, but explain to them why it is that this is so important. And that made a big, big difference. It wasn't perfect, but it was better than it could have been, for sure. I mean, we're still working out these things out. We're still trying to figure out how to make these things go smoothly for people, and it's not easy, and it's very situational, which I think is another reason why having a legally enforced rule that responsible disclosure means X is so stupid, because it's actually a much more um, contextual and subtle type of situation. So, yes? How would you rate the, uh, the knowledge of the judge in technology uh, and then... Did that hinder, if it was a lack of knowledge, did that hinder the case? And did you think that if the judge was more knowledgeable of technology and, you know, the ways of the security people work, uh, if you would have had a, an easier time, so to speak? If my scale was 0 to 10, I would give him a negative 5. Um, they don't know, this judge didn't know technology. Fortunately, we didn't need to win it on that grounds, but they don't know. And I think that the idea of that sort of unfamiliarity with it makes it sound really scary. When the, when the plaintiff comes to you, and that, that is commonly the case with with judges, is that there uh, there are some judges who know some things about technology, but uh, uh, you know if you're getting a randomly selected judge, don't bet on it. And, and it's not their fault. I mean, I didn't know anything about RFID cards really before this case either. So this may be a fairly naive question, but how does potentially slanderous language like that make it into a legal affidavit that that's then used for a search warrant? Um, this, this slanderous stuff, like that he is a yeah, master well, it's, of his it's trade who uses his... Illegal activities, specifically. Yeah. Well, that, well, Go ahead. Uh, that, that's exactly what a search warrant is supposed to be accusing somebody of, <laughs> is, is criminal behavior. All right, so the, you, you couldn't maintain a, a, a slander action against uh, uh, a police officer for making... In fact, if, if you file a civil complaint, you can't do a slander action, even though it's accusing you of doing terrible things. They're, they're all like that, because they're all like, he dealt drugs, she, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, a, that's what they're for. They're supposed to say you did something bad. But, but, but it kind of maligns... I know why you're upset. You feel personally maligned, <laughs> and maybe you could maintain a, <laughs> a defamation action, but, but our poor defendant certainly couldn't. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's one of the things that we were concerned about with the case is the idea you use Linux and that's used as the, you know, part of the, the basis for probable cause. It's like more suspicious. It's like if you send an email from Yahoo and you use Linux, that's what makes it really suspicious. Whereas if you only use the normal BC operating system, I don't know what that is. It must did, did, be Windows. Yeah, you but note that. It was, it was not they said like Windows or something. It was the BC operating system. The normal now, BC We don't think there actually system. is one. It, they probably meant is. Windows. They just didn't know what they were talking about. Yeah, so, so yes, that, would, that was that was too bad. Uh, my question is actually on your, uh, the point you made earlier, the comma. Because the judge said he didn't have jurisdiction on this, did he uh, go far enough in the case to set precedents and possibly make this something that could be argued in the future when people try to give talks and this type of action is taken against them? We didn't, so, so what, what you can cite is usually a written opinion. And we didn't get a written opinion from the judge. At the district court, at the federal district court level, it is to the discretion of the judge whether or not to write an opinion that will be published. And if he does write an opinion and it is published, then you can cite to it and it's influential. So, um, you know, what I think is that the fact that it happened and we publicized it so widely and he was right and all of that will be of influence. And certainly if we ever come across a case like this again, we will, you know, submit this to the court and we'll get, the, we have the transcript and we'll attach the transcript where the judge rules this way to the court that's reviewing it next time. But it's not as easy for other lawyers to find this and use it as an influential decision as it would have been if the judge had published it. So it's good. We can use it. But it's just not as easy to use as it would have been under other circumstances.
The, the findability is, is uh, one of the main concerns, which is to say a, a written district court opinion uh, is, is perhaps influential, but it's not binding on other courts. And if it's the Massachusetts district court, then the California court you know, might find that interesting, but it's not bound to, to, to follow it. Uh, and so if we provided the, uh, a California court or a Nevada court or, or any court with a copy of this transcript, you know, they might be persuaded by the logic of the reasoning and feel more comfortable because another judge had agreed uh, but the problem is that if it's not uh, a written opinion that doesn't get into the, the appropriate legal databases, that if a uh, attorney who was not familiar with the situation is defending that case and they do some legal research trying to find applicable cases, they might not find the case and might not realize it exists. Right, which is why we hope that they, they call us. The only thing that's actually really binding are cases from courts that are higher than you. So if I'm a district court, other district court judges can rule differently and that's no big deal. But if my circuit has, a, has an opinion on the topic, then I have to follow that. So, okay, other questions? Okay, well thank you everybody for coming and we'll uh, see you at the party. <laughs>